Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick revision of Macbeth Act 4, Scene 3, which is a really long scene, and potentially, whisper it, a bit of a boring one. But it's a really important one in terms of notions of kingship and some of the crucial themes of the play. So we'll try and whip through those really crucial bits. Given that Macduff has just turned up in England, essentially from Macbeth's court, Malcolm's understandably suspicious of him. He feels maybe he's a spy sent from Macbeth. So this is why he may be asking Macduff to go and have a bit of a quiet chat, to seek out some desolate shade and there weep our sad bosoms empty over the state of Scotland. Macduff, however, rejects this, saying that um, instead he wants to bestride our downfall and birthdom each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face. In other words, rather than having a chat about things, he wants to act. Um, he uses this image of Scotland as a wounded comrade that needs to be defended. Um, this idea of the uh, fallen birthdom that is bestrode. He's standing over his fallen comrade or the fallen Scotland and is defending it with his sword. And then we've got this asyndetic list of horrors making the suffering of the Scots appear endless. And the parallelism of the clauses gives us a sense of its inevitability that's also reinforced by the anaphora. New, new, new. The horror of the situation in Scotland is also evident in the personification of heaven being struck in the face, a really violent verb to use in terms of an attack on heaven. But what's happening in Scotland is so appalling that uh, Macduff wants to convey this idea that um, it's screaming out and hitting heaven in the face because it's so appalling. Malcolm's pretty explicit in telling Macduff that he doesn't really trust him. He says, this tyrant whose sole name blisters our tongues was once thought honest. You've loved him well, and he hath not touched you yet, which is a really ironic statement to make. Uh, there's dramatic irony there, given that the audience has just in the previous scene witnessed the destruction of Macduff's family. And Malcolm goes on to say that Macduff might be prepared to offer him up to Macbeth presenting himself as this weak, poor, innocent lamb um, offered in order to appease an angry god, that angry god being Macbeth. Um, the contrast between the two is really stark. Uh, the innocent lamb, something weak, being offered up to something that's all-powerful, a god, an angry god. It's interesting as well that Macduff's response is so short. It's a simple sentence. It's a sentence that doesn't even complete the iambic pentameter. It's so stark that it conveys his absolute certainty. I am not treacherous. Malcolm interrupts Macduff, completing the iambic pentameter with, but Macbeth is. And then he goes on to present a hendiades, Good and virtuous, uh, those two terms both essentially being synonymous. And the Hendiad is really drawing attention to the differences between the two, but also the fact that it's every aspect of goodness, every aspect of virtue that could be compromised by being under an imperial charge. An imperial charge essentially being um, the order of the king. So the meaning essentially is that even the most positive natures could be compromised by an order from the king. Macduff, as an untreacherous person, could be forced to do something treacherous because Macbeth has ordered him to do it. Then we have the theme of deception explored by Malcolm through a consideration of Lucifer, the highest, or if in this case brightest angel, who fell uh, to wage war on God and become the devil. The implication here being that Macduff could have appeared good and could still appear good, uh, but could now have become evil. Macduff's in despair when it seems that um, goodness, in the form of Malcolm, is not prepared to stop the tyranny that he's just explained is experienced by Scotland. Uh, Malcolm halts him, saying, be not offended. He says, I do think our country sinks beneath the yoke, it weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. So he personifies Scotland as a female character and one that's being assaulted. A gash is added to her wounds. He also uses this parallelism. It weeps, it bleeds. Uh, the parallelism drawing the connection between the two and suggesting that um, it's universal, it's ongoing, just as there's this coherence between the two clauses, weeps and bleeds. Having explicitly expressed his doubts about uh, Macduff, Malcolm now moves into a second attempt to test his loyalty, claiming that he himself would be a far worse king than Macbeth. 
He says, um, all the particulars of vice so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow in comparison to him. We've got that epithet black being used to represent Macbeth's evil nature. And Malcolm's self-proclaimed evil is said to be so bad that it would make Macbeth appear pure as snow. The simile making the contrast between Macbeth and Malcolm really stark. We've already heard moments before Malcolm describe himself as an innocent lamb in comparison to the angry god of Macbeth. But now he subverts that, using the simile once again, but this time to describe what the country's perception of Macbeth will be in comparison to his future self. Macbeth will seem like the lamb because Malcolm will be so bad. Shakespeare then introduces the semantic field of hell to illustrate Macduff's incredulity. He doesn't believe that anyone could be worse than Macbeth, and this semantic field illustrates how terrible Macbeth is, and therefore nobody could be worse than him. Malcolm describes Macbeth through a asyndetic list of negative adjectives that really demonstrate the nature of his horror because he has so many vices. Uh, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. The list seems endless because it's asyndetic. But he claims to be worse, having no limit to just one of these vices, lust. He claims he'll have any woman, young or old, and will still not be satisfied. Maduff criticises Malcolm's uh, lack of virtue here, describing it as a tyranny. But he suggests that Malcolm could still satisfy his desires while appearing chaste, or as he terms it, cold, as there'd be sufficient women willing to sleep with the king. And it's worth noting that even Macduff is prepared to deceive, advocating that Malcolm essentially looks like the innocent flower in order to avoid the greater evil of Macbeth. He says, the time you may so hoodwink, uh, an allusion to imagery that we've already come across in the play. And then we get this zoomorphism of the vulture conveying the indiscriminate desire of someone lecherous, given that the vulture, as a carrion bird, would eat anything. Macduff's points that Malcolm can't be so voracious that he'd consume all of those who would be prepared to sleep with the king, and therefore he's still a better alternative than Macbeth. But Malcolm's not finished. He goes, with this, or in addition to this, there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a Danchless, avarice, that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands. Um, so he's moved from this kind of lust to now the vice of greed, a stanchless avarice. And he says that there would be a source to make me hunger more. Uh, the simile of source being used to suggest that Malcolm, having tasted the wealth of others, would just become more hungry for more. It's like eating a chocolate, you know, just one chocolate, one chocolate, only one chocolate. And instead, with Malcolm, it's like, oh, I'll just have these jewels and those jewels and all the jewels. Again, we get the same pattern in Macduff's response. Again, he's not happy. He says that avarice is worse than lust and has metaphorically killed previous kings of Scotland. It have been the sword of our slain kings. But still, he's determined that Malcolm will be better than Macbeth. Um, he claims that Scotland has enough resources or foisons that will belong to the king to satisfy Malcolm's appetites, in the same way that he claimed that there would be enough women to want to sleep with the king to satisfy his lust. Malcolm then gives us the list of king-becoming graces, or virtues, that are appropriate for a king. Uh, justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude... And the fact that it's presented in an asyndetic list again gives a sense of those virtues being seemingly endless. But Malcolm denies that he's got any of these virtues. In fact, he says that if he had the power, he would pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, which is very reminiscent of Macbeth's comments in Act 4, Scene 1, where he said he was prepared to sacrifice the universal order in order to serve his needs till destruction sicken. It might also remind us of Lady Macbeth's first description of Macbeth as being too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. In other words, that he's too kind, and here Malcolm is claiming the opposite, that he's actually too cruel. Macduff can't believe what he's hearing, and he certainly can't accept the kind of man that Malcolm describes himself as being. And by doing so, he reveals his own honesty. He not only rejects Malcolm's capacity to govern, but also says he doesn't deserve to live. It's clear, therefore, that Macduff isn't here to flatter Malcolm. He isn't here to try and 
get in with him in order to trick him into some kind of feigned attack on Scotland um, that would bring about his undoing. So Macduff is demonstrating that he's trustworthy. He goes on to say, O nation miserable with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred. This is a reflection on Macbeth. With him not being titled, he's therefore illegal. He's an illegal king. He's not justified in that role. And he's a tyrant whose kingship is represented metonymically by the scepter. It's a bloody scepter. A scepter is a symbol of kingship, but it was achieved through bloodshed, through murder. And Macduff can't believe this because... He recognises that Malcolm's parents were absolutely saintly. He actually describes Duncan as a sainted king. He describes Malcolm's mother as a queen who was oftener on her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived. In other words, she prayed more often than she stood, and she prepared herself for heaven, died every day, by praying and conversing with God. In a lengthy speech that follows, Malcolm basically says, look, I've been lying about everything that I've just told you. Um, he's made up these vices in order to test Macduff's loyalty. He now states that he's actually the opposite of what he's said previously, and that his earlier words represented the first lie that he's ever told. One of the interesting things as well is that uh, we've got another uh, epithet for Macbeth that's from the semantic field of hell, devilish Macbeth. In contrast to this, we get a reference to Edward the Confessor. The king has the divine touch, a God-given gift that grants him the power to heal, as a result of him being the divinely chosen representative of God on earth, the divine right of kings. The Fane of Ross arrives and begins to depict the horror of life in Scotland under Macbeth's rule. He says it cannot be called our mother, but our grave. That kind of antithetical parallelism contrasting what Scotland should be, in terms of nurturing the mother, and what it now is, the grave, uh, somewhere associated purely with death. Um, he says, where nothing but who knows nothing is once seen to smile. So the only ones who are happy are those who are ignorant in Scotland. And we also get the idea that people die frequently and quickly. The dead man's knell is there, scarce asked for who, and good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps dying or ere they sicken. Ross is clearly reluctant to tell Macduff about the murder of his family. He uses a homographic pun, at peace, which initially is used to suggest, you know, peaceful, but here seems to be a euphemism for dead. He wishes Malcolm to lead an army north, something that Macduff has been seeking as well, but he might not have wanted to disclose the news of Macduff's family's murder until he learns that Malcolm's been persuaded. We are coming thither. Once Ross is assured of Malcolm's support, all his euphemisms are removed and we get the harsh reality of the situation. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. And that emotive verb's modified by an adverb to render it even more horrific, savagely slaughtered. He says to relate to the manner were on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. And so we have this image of a pile of hunted deer conveying the helplessness of Macduff's family. And once again, we've got a pun, this time a homophonic pun based on deer as in stags and deer as in held deer or emotionally important. Macduff really can't accept that um, his wife and children have been murdered. He keeps posing these interrogatives. My children too, my wife killed too, and then later on, all my pretty ones. And that inability to accept, I think, generates uh, sympathy for his character. Macbeth, again, is described through that semantic field of hell. Here is a creature of hell, uh, zoomorphically described as a kite, which is a bird of prey, killing Macduff's chickens in one fell swoop. That image capturing the defenceless nature of Macduff's family and the ruthlessness of Macbeth. Macduff goes on to blame himself for his family's murder. Um, heaven didn't intercede because of his own sins. And that self-deprecation is in stark contrast to the kind of selfish approach that we've witnessed already with Macbeth, and also Macbeth's hubris in Act 5. And finally, as we've seen, Macbeth has been described through the semantic field of hell throughout this scene, and towards its conclusion we have another hellish metaphor for Macbeth, fiend of Scotland. Okay, ta.